Good morning, Messiah. Again, this is the pastor speaking to you from the sanctuary of the Messiah Baptist Church. And our prayer has been and will continue to be that the Lord would keep us safe from hurt, harm, and danger to wit the coronavirus because uh, it's all around us and it's not getting any better, contrary to what the doctors tell us. We, uh, as far as announcements are concerned, we have in this month would normally be scheduled the Sanctuary Choir Musical and the Laverne Berry Couples Day. So just remember, uh, choir members, do your own solos at home and get ready for sooner or later you will have an opportunity to uh, do your musical. And as far as couples are concerned, we pray that everything is well in your household and you are happy and doing well. Uh, that's about it for this month. Thank you. This week we are speaking to you from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 45 and 46. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I want to use the subject, why have you forsaken us? Why have you forsaken us? As we continue to face the possibility of contracting coronavirus and watching over six million Americans of being afflicted, we have asked the question, where is God? Today, about 185,000 of Americans have died from this disease, and we ask the question, where is God? Why has God forsaken us? In the midst of all of this suffering and death, why has God forsaken us? We see people in the ICU. We have family and friends, and we are not permitted to go in and visit them, and many of them are dying without having a last word or a comforting look from a relative. They are making their transitions alone with hospital staff. But we understand that God is still a good God, and then they die alone. We are walking around with our faces covered, trying to avoid getting the disease and taking all possible precautions the president is not concerned with the health of the American people. It is what it is. Just keep me in office by any means necessary. I can always explain these numbers, the deaths and the illness. Just blame Obama, the Democrats, or the far left, and I'll go play golf and lie my way out of it. It is what it is. David first uttered these words in Psalm 22, 1, and it reads, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and I am not silent. David is saying, I have cried all day and all night trying to get some help. And it seems that the Lord is far from me. I need to feel your presence. I feel deserted. I have no one else to depend on. And now it looks as though you have forsaken me. So Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that called me from the sheepfold of Jesse's sheep, and let me walk as a king among your people. I was chosen. And then I'm a man after God's own heart. And I feel deserted and abandoned. So David just says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Job had his problems. And when we look at Job, he was committed that no matter how bad the situation became, he would maintain his integrity and hold on. In Job 13, 15, you find these words. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. That is total commitment. 
And then Job had patience. And he realized that everything in this realm that we call life is temporary. So when we look at Job 14, 14, it says, All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. Job realized that the situation was dire. The situation was grave. But he didn't have enough concern for his own well-being as to show how good God is. And so, hold on, church. God is still in control. God will still work it out for us. When we look at why have you forsaken us, when we look at the word abandon, it simply means left alone without care for our support. And that's the way many of us feel now. We are depressed because it seems that we can't go to church. We can't go to restaurants. We can't go to movies. We are confined to home. Many of us can't go to work. We just feel depressed and rejected. But I'm here to tell you, just hold on like Job. All the days of your appointed time, he waited until his change came. The son, and when Jesus was on the cross, the son had bowed in humble submission. It was dark from the sixth to the ninth hour. The creation was being submissive to the creator. Physically, Jesus' pain was excruciating. His hand and feet had been nailed to the cross. His back was cut to the bone from the scourging. His uh, in, in, internal organs were pushed downward, and it was very painful for him to even take a breath. All of his disciples had abandoned him, with the exception of John. Peter, who said he would die for him and denied him three times. Judas, that betrayed him, had hung himself. The other disciples, no one knows where they were, fulfilling the scripture. I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the fold of the flock will be scattered abroad. In Hebrews 5, 7, and 9, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. There are times in this life when father and mother cannot or will not help you out of the situation you're in. Psalm 2710 says, when my mother and my father forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. When the doctors tell you you have stage four cancer and there is nothing they can do, has God abandoned you? When your child is ill and the doctors can't determine what the problem is, has God abandoned you? When your life is being turned upside down and you lay awake all night and you have no appetite, when all of your family and friends have all walked away, has God abandoned you? In these three, you need the kind of help that only a God can give. You cry, Lord, have mercy. Father and mother cannot help. You need a God. Although the four Gospels, Jesus referred to God as Father, but in his physical suffering and being abandoned, he calls him God, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus was experiencing something completely foreign to him. He and his father had never been separated from the time that God had begotten him until this day. In John 1, 1 through 3, talking about the Logos, the Logos, a theological phrase which expresses the absolute eternal and ultimate being of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
And at the age of 12, he first declared that he is God's son. In Luke 2, 49, it reads, And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Was, not, was ye not that I, was, I must be about my father's business? When he was baptized in the Jordan by John, God acknowledged him as his son and declared, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And just a few days ago, God acknowledged him a second time on the mountain of transfiguration by saying, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. And then in Philippians 2 and 8, and being found and fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had to hold God accountable. He says, well, you never abandoned Adam, and Adam was disobedient. You, dis you didn't desert Noah. He was nothing more than an alcoholic. And then you kept him and gave him a rainbow in the sky. Abraham was a liar. And you stayed with him. Jacob was a trickster and a crook. And you didn't desert him. You blessed him and changed his name to Israel. David was an adulterer and caused a man to be put in a position where he would more than likely lose his life. And then you appointed him and assigned him a man after your own heart. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? and from the words of my ruins. The question, why have you forsaken me? God's reply, if I don't forsake you, all that you have done and all that you've gone through have been for nothing. Too much sin on your son. If I turn around and go back, the prophecy would not have been fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, for the law would have failed. Man will remain under condemnation. Man will not be justified. If I don't forsake you, you can't die, for I am the giver and the sustainer of life. If I don't forsake you, death will keep his stinger. The grave will have the victory. I must forsake you. You are man's only hope of salvation. You are man's only hope of sanctification. You are man's only hope of redemption. You are man's only hope of reconciliation. You promised that you would never leave us alone. In Matthew 28, 20, it says, Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He promised never to leave us alone. He promised never to abandon us. One who was abandoned knows what it is to be left alone in a moment of stress. He knows what it is to not have anyone to stand with him in his moment of trial, in his moment of pain, in the moment of his suffering. He's all by himself. Even the father turned his back on him and walked away. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it, a song comes to mind. It says, I have seen the lightning flashing. I've heard the thunders roll. I felt sin's breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. I heard the voice of my Savior bid me still to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. So in our dying moments, in our moments when we feel so much despair upon us, remember, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I want to tell you this morning that God has not forsaken you. He's just waiting on us to turn to him and to ask for help. Thank you. This being the first Sunday in September, we are now entering our communion period. I do hope that all of you that desire to have communion would access it through the office, church office, call and make arrangements to pick it up or have your communion delivered to you. And we ask that you take two or three different ones because we don't know how many long we're going to be. And it'd be a lot, a lot more uh, 
uh, easier for us if you would take two or three, and that would carry you through uh, December. And so uh, by all means, call the church office and make the arrangements to get your elements and then have communion with us on the first Sunday. On the night that Jesus instituted what we are now observing, one of the ordinances of our church, the first being that of baptism and the second being that of the Lord's Supper. He did not partake of these elements. He took the remnants from the Passover meal and he divided it among his disciples, that being the unleavened bread and the wine. And he said, take ye, eat all of it, for this is my broken body. And he gave the chalice around and he said, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood that is shed for the remission of sin. There is no way that those 11 disciples could have understood the significance of what he was doing. We have been privy to understand and to see the effects of taking these elements representing the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Almost everything is cleansed by the blood. And so we are going to partake of these elements. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come thanking your Master that things are as well as they are. We have come now to the ninth month of the year. Six months we have been unable to worship in our sanctuary. But we realize that you are still in control and that you are the master of this universe. You created it, you created us, and we are the sheep of your pastor. So, Master, we pray and we call upon your holy and righteous name to continue to bless this congregation and bless their families and protect them from all the hurt, harm, and danger that's awaiting them in this society. We pray for those that have lost loved ones due to violence in the streets, the loved ones that have been taken from their families uh, by the police. We want to say, Master, you are justice, and in you is justice. And as long as they don't consult you and we don't call upon your name, justice cannot rain down. So, Master, we're calling on you right now, asking you to restore order in your universe. Restore order, restore order in your church. Restore order in the streets of our cities. We come also to say, Master, you have been good to us, and you have protected this congregation, and we pray that you will continue to protect this congregation from this virus. Keep us in your keeping, and we will be kept. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our friends. And above all, we thank you for your church that stands now, Master, almost vacated. But we still recognize that you are the one that we do worship. And we can worship you under our own vine and fig tree. And so we worship you in the name of Jesus. This, and we pray for the elements that we are about to ingest, representing your broken body, representing the blood that you shed for the remission of our sins. This we pray in the name of Jesus, amen. And he took the bread, he broke it, he blessed it, and said, take, eat all of it, for this is my broken body. In like manner, he took the cup. He said, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood that is shed for the remission of sin. There was no benediction on this occasion. They simply sang a hymn and went out.